Hey everybody, thanks for joining our webinar today. We're a few minutes out here. I'm just gonna give it a few more minutes just to let everybody get signed in here and we'll get started. Uh, probably a little bit just the top of the hour. Looks like everybody's coming in now. Welcome, welcome. If you're so inclined, where's everybody dialing in from? I'm here in Denver, Colorado. Where's Zane at? So oh, I'm in Denver. California. San Diego. We got some. Texas. Buffalo. There's the New Yorkers. This is an NYOUG webinar, so. <laughs> New York, India. Oh, from Data Vale. <laughs> Glad to have you. Mr. Dan Grant, nope. you've won Frog. your uh, day of Aleopoly. I'm going to reach out to you, one of our games. Anybody who's been on our NYOUG webinars know that if you join early, I've got a giveaway while we wait. Oh, yeah, Prague. Okay, welcome. Yeah, we're right. trying to go there for Christmas. We'll see you Ooh. there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Let's see where we're at here. I think we're starting to taper off here. Okay, let's get started. Hey everyone, thanks for joining DataVail's webinar today in partnership with New York Oracle Users Group. Oracle Practice Team Manager Zane Wharton will be your speaker today and will be covering what can you accomplish with Oracle database in memory features. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items. Please submit any questions at the bottom panel of your screen in the Q&A section, and Zane will do his best to cover them at the end of today's session, time permitting. We're recording today's session and we'll be sending out a replay of the webinar as soon as it's available. You can also access links to Oracle resources in the chat section that I'll be adding once we get started. All right, Zane, where I go. Great, thanks. Uh, Oracle's in-memory functionality is a truly transformational technology once you know how to get the most out of it. This session will equip you with the strategic, strategic information you need to begin to implement it as part of your modern database architecture. Um, today's presentation is partnership with the uh, New York Oracle Users Group. Special thanks to them for their event promotions for this webinar. For you, those of you who might be unfamiliar with the uh, New York Oracle Users Group, welcome. There will be some additional information on how to connect with them at the end of the webinar. I'm Zane Wharton. I've been a DBA for about 20 years or more, which makes me feel old. Uh, I've had, been in multiple roles in industries, uh, including uh, telecom and healthcare and financial stuff and new oil and gas and you name it. Uh, I'm OCP certified and have a master's of uh, Master's of Science degree in information systems. And currently I lead a small team of DBAs uh, and we deliver services to over hundred different customers. Uh, Dataville itself has been in uh, service, uh, Dataville has been in database services for over 16 years, starting out primarily supporting Oracle and SQL Server. In the last decade, we have added support for other database systems such as Mongo, DB, Postgres, MySQL, and others. Um, through growth and acquisitions, we've also expanded to other areas of managed services. I encourage you to check out our web or social media presences if you'd like any more information. 
Uh, Jenna will now talk about our cloud adoption survey and giveaway. All right, thanks, Zane. Of course, it wouldn't be a webinar without more giveaways. DataVail is trying to learn more about organizations' cloud adoptions and usage for different workflows. And as part of this, we'd like you to take part in our cloud adoption survey that we've launched through Tech Validate, an independent surveyor. Uh, please use the link in the slide to complete. I'm also going to add this to the chat function so that you can access easier. And later today, we'll be selecting a winner from today's webinar to win a work from home package that includes a data veilopoly, a mask, noise canceling headphones, a hoodie, a data veil insulated cup, and a Sherpa blanket. So make sure you get that done today so that we have all of your answers. Thanks, Zane. Back to you. Thanks. Okay, we'll be covering today is Oracle in memory. It's a release history and licensing. What is Oracle in memory? It's release history and licensing options, how to configure it and how to load uh, some tables in memory. Uh, we'll also kind of look at the in memory advisor a bit, or at least some pictures of it. And we'll look at some example queries and explain plans. All right, Oracle Database in Memory adds in many database functionality to existing databases. It transparently accelerates analytics by orders of magnitude while simultaneously speeding up mixed load, uh, mixed workload OLTP. It allows users to get immediate, immediate answers to business questions that previously took hours. A typical uh, OLTP, which is online transaction uh, processing database, is a collection of row stored tables and try to think of something like you might see in Microsoft Excel with the typical rows and columns. Uh, indexes are used to uh, speed up access to particular rows or maintain uniqueness in tables. Oracle loads the most frequently referenced rows into a row-based memory cache. Uh, queries that add, modify, or delete rows work best in this environment. Analytical queries can access fewer columns with multiple rows. They're used to help uh, you understand your data and make business decisions about that data. Those queries that typically been run against data warehouse, those kinds of queries have been typically run against data where warehouses, uh, which kind of collect data from you know, multiple database streams sometimes, or, you know, or just maybe hit more history or whatever. Uh, those use additional indexing and staging tables to help speed up those queries. Um, this increases cost complexity and data lag because you're supporting multiple databases. You have to somehow keep that data in sync and uh, it can be complex to you know, track all that activities or all those activities. Oracle in memory uses a section of your server memory to pivot your data into compressed columnar storage. That may eliminate the need for additional warehousing or warehouse database or other kinds of indexing or your staging tables. We'll kind of walk through a little bit of that. Uh, your data is therefore stored two ways in memory. It's both in the column store and in a row store. Having both row store and column store access to your data will deliver outstanding performance for transactions as well as much improved performance when making business, making data driven, driven business decisions. I'll go through some examples of analytical queries and demonstrate how the optimizer changes plans later in this presentation. Oops. Uh, it's important to understand what types of analytical queries uh, benefit most from the IAM column store, since not all queries will benefit equally. Uh, and you'll see this particular graph is from this uh, uh, document Oracle produced about in memory. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, the greater the ratio of the total data accessed by a query to the data processed by that query, the greater the potential benefit from database in memory. For example, Let's consider the following scenarios. Query A scans a table with a million rows, but 990,000 rows are limited by the query predicates. And the pretty query predicates are the where conditions associated with a query to try to limit or control what you're trying to access. You're not gonna to wanna to pull back all the data most of the time. Query B scans the same million row table, but only 10,000 rows are limited by the query predicates. Although both queries access 1 million rows equally, query A processed only 10,000 rows since the rest are limited by their predicates, while query B processes 990,000 rows and only 10,000 are eliminated. Query A therefore spends a far greater fractions of its total execution time on data access than query B does. Query A will experience a greater reduction in execution time than query B if the tables are in a memory. Hopefully that was somewhat clear. 
Um, so uh, in memory options, this, this is a brief summary of some of the in memory feature history. I mean, you really couldn't contain all their changes on a slide or uh, suppose you could have multiple slides, but not, not I'm trying to keep this brief. Uh, version 1.2 or 12.1 enabled uh, columnar format, allowing only needed columns to be scanned and filtered. And um, so modern microprocessors support uh, SIMD, which is single instruction for multiple data values. It's vector processing instructions to accelerate graphics and scientific computing. Oracle database in memory uh, uses the SIMD vector instructions to help process multiple column values in a sim single CPU clock cycle. Uh, tables are, so this is the in-memory storage indexing. Um, tables are split into sections and minimum and max and values of every column are maintained for each section of a table. Uh, this allows queries to quickly skip table sections that only contain data outside of the range of data needed by the query. So in 12.2, you got in-memory for active data guard. If you're already offloading reporting to your active data guard instance, then you can now use in-memory features here. Heat maps, allowing data to be added, remover, removed from the in-memory column store based on temperature and memory pressure. We'll kind of talk about that a little later. Bloom filter and join groups will we will discuss in the SQL example, examples section. Uh, IME allows the storing of virtual columns of pre-calculated um, values. And those are in-memory expressions, kind of like a function-based index, uh, but it's stored as a column. Uh, and then Exadata Flash, uh, you can have terabytes of flash cache, which can be that which Oracle can extend this sort of columnar memory section to. Uh, in 18C, uh, they added automatic in memory, which is help you, which will help you automatically manage the contents of the in memory column store. Basically, if the sum of the space of the segments that have been enabled for in memory exceeds the available memory in the in memory column store, the automatic in memory will kick in and help manage the column store space using heat map statistics. Uh, it uses access tracking, column statistics, and other relevant statistics uh, so that segments can be automatically evicted from the column store to make room for the population of more active segments. And then in 19C, uh, support for external tables. So you don't even have to have your, your table in, in your normal database, you can be an external file can be turned into a column store. And you can use Research ma Manager to help uh, manage your you know, processes and queries and other things like that that are coming into your system. Um, licensing requirements. Uh, in memory is available uh, as a, you, uh, it's a licensing purchase. You have to buy a license for it for either on-prem uh, enterprise edition or uh, Enterprise Edition uh, EX. I don't remember what EX is. Uh, it's not available for standard edition, of course, like so many other things. Uh, it's included with certain OCI database releases, including Enterprise Edition Extreme Performance and uh, Exadata Cloud Service. Uh, there's also a trial setup allowed. Uh, there's a base level you can set in memory. Uh, I think you, I have my notes here say 21C, but it might be a little bit before this. It uh, allows you to use up to 16 gig column store without triggering triggering the license tracking. So it basically gives you an opportunity to try it out. It not, you know with just 16 gigs, it's probably not going to provide all your needs, but at least you can use it for a few tables and see how that helps might help your organization. Uh, so some of the useful in memory views we see here are the DBA. I mean the feature usage statistics talk about what features you've used. That's good to see you know, if you're matching up with your licensing uh, agreements and such. So, you know, you can see if you violated the license, I suppose. Uh, DBA segments and DBA tables both have new columns for in-memory and in-memory priority. To, and you can use that to see if that particular table has been loaded in or not. Uh, active session history, uh, which is Oracle's sampling of uh, session information as, as the database runs along. Uh, has new columns for in-memory query and in-memory populate to let you know if it's either populating the, the memory store or using those as part of a query or using the in-memory segments as part of a query. Uh, in-memory segments actually tells you, you know, exactly what segments from what tables and what their compression ratios are and stuff. Uh, in-memory area 
uh, talks about space allocation there. And SDA, of course, shows you your system global area, which explains uh, how you're using your memory on the bus. Uh, to simply to set it up, it's re relatively one of the you know best features about this is the ease of, of configuration, or at least initial configuration. Uh, you can just set your in-memory size parameter and restart your system. Uh, it, it, you have to bounce it, you can't do it live. Uh, you wanna make sure you check your system memory, that you have plenty of server memory and you're not over allocating things. Uh, going into swap will not help your performance. And uh, you need to adjust your SDA targets or memory targets, depending on what memory strategy you're using to make sure you have uh, room for everything. So when you use Oracle uh, or use the, uh, in OEM, you know, this is what your in-memory things will look like. Let's see if I can get this little focus thing to work. Uh, it shows you what your in-memory pool size is in comparison with your other pools, which is keen. Uh, it breaks out everything into a nice little uh, pie, pie graph for you to figure out how things are going. Um, so, and then of course the numbers are on the lower left if uh, you're using OEM, and this is available. Um, so if you wanna check the in-memory pool, uh, so even though you might set it up and you restart it and you wanna see, you know, you're excited about things going on, you're, you're still gonna see that uh, it's not necessarily used right away. Uh, you still have to take two other steps. And, uh, and as a general rule, the, not all objects in your Oracle database are gonna benefit from the column store. It's really gonna to have to be things that you're going to query against and specifically sort of using analytical queries are best. Um, and the, the memory use is very efficient because there's compression added where Oracle, especially on a columnar level, I hope you've heard about Exadata in memory, you know, column compression that you know, kind of uses some of that technology to uh, help with this in-memory side. Uh, your application architect can help determine the most critical database objects that could be loaded into memory. Uh, so to load tables into memory, uh, you basically, it's just a addition alter, you alter a table or you, when you create a table, you can add the in-memory option. Uh, and uh, just a note here, my examples and queries that I'm showing here are uh, not part of any particular client that we're using that are using uh, in memory, although we do have some clients that are starting to use it. Uh, they're from the Oracle Open World Database and Memory Hands-On Lab by Andy Ravines. I have a link to that uh, hands-on lab at the end of this presentation. I highly encourage you to go try it out because it goes into a lot of depth on what we're doing. Uh, there's a, the, uh, here's an example of the alter statements required for the first step. Uh, additionally, when the tables are to be altered in memory, you can set the in-memory priority from critical to low. Critical will load the table at Oracle startup and low will load it after other tables are already in there if there is room. Uh, there are many additional options for the in-memory settings. Please refer to your documentation. Uh, at the end of this, or the notes at the end of this segment, and they'll kind of go through a lot of those options, or at least some of those options. Oracle will automatically decide when to populate the tables in memory in the column store. Typically, that's going to be done as demand as you load the data. Um, so even these simple counts, uh, so even these are, these are added in memory, they're not necessarily going to be populated there. You go back, check the query from the previous page. They're not gonna be in there yet, but when you start counting or do other kinds of queries against those tables, they will start to populate. So don't be concerned if you're not seeing data right away. Uh, so now if we go and look, we can see that some of the date dim customer line order status are uh, loaded. You can see the status in the, v, v, uh, the VDollar IM segments. Uh, and another option you have is you don't have to do this by table. And actually you can do it by table and by particular columns, but um, you can also do it by table space. So very similar, uh, you can do the creator alter table space and memory commands uh, to, or you can go inside of OEM if you like to use OEM to do your administration and you can alter the uh, tables inside of there. Uh, so you can easily check what kind of compression ratios you're getting when you look at the V dollar IM section, section uh, IM segments. 
So over here on the right, you'll see that uh, it tells you what the disk size is and what it looks like in memory, and then uh, the compression ratio associated with it. So it even seems like some aren't quite compressed, but it's okay, those are relatively small. Um, so uh, data guard and rack also have their own minute in memory settings. Uh, like I say, I think this was added in uh, 12.2. Uh, so an active data guard instance uh, can have its own memory settings from the column store. You can have a set of tables using the memory pool. You can have a different set of tables using the memory pool than you in the primary. So this uh, in memory for service option is how you would set uh, what tables might be available in your primary instance as opposed to what tables might be available in your active data guard instance. Uh, similarly, each node in a rack environment has its own in-memory column store and it might be possible to have completely different objects populated in each node or to have the larger um, objects distributed across all of the uh, IAM column store nodes in the cluster. So if your application is um, rack aware, which I hope it is, um, it might be, you know, reporting services might be going to one side of the rack as opposed to the other. And you might want to have a different set of tables in the column store there. Um, how each object is populated in the column store is, is displayed in the in-memory distribute column of the tables views, you know, the uh, all tables or DBA tables, whatever. The uh, default is auto distribute, which where automatic, Oracle automatically just dis, uh, decides how an object should be distributed among all the IAM column stores in a rack environment. So to assist you in deciding if you don't have a, an application architect or you know you buy your application from a vendor, so you don't have really a, a, you know somebody that, that understands the internals necessarily, Oracle has a lovely tool, the in-memory advisor. That is the, this number up here is the doc ID to, uh, with the instructions to install it. You can install this and this will uh, add a entry into your database setting where you can see in-memory central, which will take you to the in-memory advisor section of, OM, of your OMS. Uh, I think these are, kind of blurry, but hopefully they're good enough to give you a good idea. Uh, it will produce a report that uh, lists the number of in-memory si sizes with estimated performance benefits, lists the objects which should be placed in the in-memory column store for a given in-memory size and the recommended, recommended compression, compression factor for those objects. So if you look over here on the left, it kind of shows you what your SGA said. This is just an example. so. These numbers aren't really critical. Shows you what your enable memory is. It, it, it shows you what some of your options are with the in-memory query and the in-memory force, whether or not it forces um, in-memory operations. It then goes over here and kind of divides out what tables are in the in-memory size map. And then over here on the left, it's got the, you know, your particular statistics with how much is populated. It's basically that IAM segments view that we were looking at earlier, except uh, expressed in OEM. Uh, the in-memory advisor analyzes the uh, analytical processing workload present in your database to determine an estimated benefit for the database as a whole. Advisor produces a recommendation report uh, optimized for the in-memory size you specify. Once you have generated a report optimized for your chosen in-memory size, the next section of the report lists the SQL statements uh, with the highest estimated performance benefit from the specific, specified in-memory size optimization. Next in the report is a list of the objects which are recommended to be placed in the in-memory column store along with the recommended compression type for each object. Um, so it's great, use it. Or, uh, and here's an example of more of the in-memory advisor report. There's also a HTML version and a text version that you can look at. Uh, it gives you that SQL plus script uh, to allow you to take and just kind of run it at your instance. It's, or I believe you can you can execute it from here too. So this generate recommendations section uh, it works a lot like a lot of the other advisors, uh, which is great. All right, so here are some query examples. So 
Sorry, my throat's getting a little dry from all this talking. Here. Um, so the, I'm going to start with some pretty simple queries here. I don't think I'm going to do anything that's super complicated. Again, these are from that uh, hands-on lab that kind of walks through things. Uh, so here's your, you know, a nice simple query that looks for the most expensive order received to date. And it does, you know, your normal full table scan of your line order table. And you can see that the cost over here is uh, 24,000. So it's pretty high cost, mostly it's doing a full table scan. You know, it's got to go through and read every single row in order to uh, check out the thing or answer the question that you're asking, which is for that most expensive order received to date. Uh, the in-memory plan, you notice that there's going to be new options that show up. You'll see table access in-memory full show up. Uh, it's really nice that Oracle clearly documents when it's using the in-memory column store, so you can see what kind of benefit it does. And you'll see that the cost in this particular query, which is a simple query, but already we're going from um, the previous thousands to, what was it? 24,000 down to 900, so less than 1,000. Uh, overall time was uh, you know, 1.02 seconds versus 0.03 seconds, um, which is, doesn't sound like a big deal. It isn't for an individual query, but if these things run a lot, or if you know, this is an example, the, um, you know, your, your actual data might be you know, gigabytes or terabytes in size and uh, the order of magnitude roughly scales, you know, of course it all, you know, with every database question, it depends on your particular data and your particular setup and the particular query. But in general, it seems to me that it scales pretty well, at least for our clients that seem to be using it. Uh, the in-memory uh, cost is much less because it only has to scan two columns instead of going through every row and, and pinging on that particular column, it actually just goes down the column and starts checking out the values. Uh, and the, the, uh, the in-memory column store also benefits from the fact that data is compressed, it can benefit from the SIMD vector processing we spoke about. Uh, so the volume of data scanned is much less. You know, in each of these little chunks of column or memory, you have like a high value and low value for each chunk. So it doesn't have to go through and scan like uh, in the row store where it scans each little thing. It's uh, somewhat like an index where it can just scan, you know, look at that beginning value, look at the beginning value of the next chunk. And that way it can prune a bunch of chunks and not even have to go through them. So that's a lot of the improvement of these scans. Our second example, uh, it's a, so this is a query you'd normally expect when, you know, would use an index. There's not an index in this table, uh, but you see it has to do yet another full table scan of this query. It's just looking up a, um, a, you know, a couple, uh, the key, the customer key of the local revenue for a particular uh, line item. And you see it's doing that full table scan, which, you know, not unsurprisingly has that same cost, 24,000, where it has to go through and look at every single row of the table. Uh, the in-memory portion of that plan, uh, you know, you see that table access in-memory full, you see that the uh, cost decreases again to you know less than a thousand, and uh, you it talks. It shows you it's using the in-memory filter. Uh, the hands-on lab also includes an example with an index. It still beats the index, which is impressive. Um, it, it basically demonstrates that it shows an impressive improvement over the traditional buffer cache. The IM column store has access to a storage index on each of the columns, which enables it to min-max pruning, pruning, what I talked about previously. And the where clause predicate is uh, compared to the min-max range for each in-memory segments of the corresponding column. And if the value doesn't fall with the specified range, then the segment is comp skipped completely. So it really speeds up access. So even though memory is fast, and even though um, you know, you're only query, you're only scanning it in memory and both these things. Uh, you, you still want to keep your, you know, your buffer hits down, your your logical reads to as small as numbers you can. It just speeds everything up. So here's a more complicated query that has this is more of your uh, normal plan. It's uh, joining the line order in the dimension table, the fact table, line order, 
And then dimension table date dim, it calculates the amount of revenue increase that would have resulted from eliminating certain company wide discounts at a given percentage range for products shipped on a given day, which in this case is Christmas Eve, 1996. Uh, you'll see the plan having the standard hash of two tables, uh, it costs 24K, uh, you know, mostly is this line order table as full, which is the 24,000 that we saw on the previous slides. It's having to hash join these two values, which basically, um, you know, reads through this to match up to create a hash table so that it matches up uh, the all the items in the in the line order. Um, so, the in memory column store has no problem uh, executing a query with a join because it takes advantage of Bloom filters. So you see again, our cost is dropped. Uh, you can see that it has the Join filter create, which is a little bit different. It's the bloom filter and we'll look more at that. Um, here's the join filter doing the access in memory full for the date, dim and line order tables. The cost drops down to a thousand, pretty similar to the other, I think the costs are in the 900 range for the other tables. And you see that the time goes from 0.88 second to 0.02. And then you also see these fun little bloom filter sections of the in the predicates. And I'm going to explain it, um, just roughly quoting how the hands on Lime explains it because bloom filters are fairly complicated and I couldn't explain it any better. So when two tables are joined via hash join, the first table, typically the smaller table, is scanned in the rows that satisfied the where clause predicates for that table are used to create a hash table. During the hash table creation, a bit vector or bloom filter is created based on the join column. The bit vector is then sent as an additional predicate to the second table scan. So it's by having an extra where clause. And, and after the where clause predicates have been applied to the second table scan, the resulting rows will have their join columns hashed and it will be compared to values in the vec bit vector. You can see that using the bloom, that the use of the bloom filters in the predicate information section of the explain file. Um, so final thoughts about uh, Oracle in memory, very easy setup. There's no application changes uh, required. You basically identify, you kind of choose what kind of memory you have available for your system. You, uh, you know, set up the changes, identify the tables, uh, but still, all those can be done kind of in an afternoon. Um, of course, if there's anything, it can have further tuning later on. It's most useful for analytical queries, but also help other operations. Uh, we demonstrated that with the uh, you know lookup queries and even the simple uh, join. And uh, it allows potential removing of some of your indexing, uh, which will make your updates faster, typically. And your and most of all, it will allow your single disk database to support a mixed workload. So instead of having your primary database and a secondary database that's sort of a data warehouse, you might be able to have all that combined into one single instance, which is uh, exciting and can save you time and money. Uh, so here are the sources I use for this. Please review them. There's lots and lots and lots of details. I tried to summarize it as best as I could. Um, here's the connection for information we spoke about earlier for the New York Oracle Users Group. Please connect with them if you're not already. And uh, here is information with a link to the Oracle Group community. I'll hand it back to Jenna. Yes, thank you, Zane. Make sure you go ahead and fill out the cloud adoption survey for your chance to win. That link is in the chat box. In case you've missed it, I'll add it again here. Is it just in so it's at the top? Give me a minute here. And I think we can go right into Q&A. It looks like we have one question in there. Um, as a reminder, go ahead and submit your questions down in the Q&A section for us. Okay, so the first question is the, what happens when the in-memory size is not large enough to load a table or tables loaded in memory? 
Uh, it uses that heat information. So it tries to, I mean, it's kind of like the buffer, buffer cache. It tries to um, load that current, um, load the, you know, as much as the table as it can. And it tries to load the table that's most recently accessed. So it acts basically a lot like your buffer cache. Uh, and it's also not expected that you're, you, you shouldn't be putting all your tables, of course, into the uh, in-memory section. You're only going to be pointing those that are um, useful and identified either through the tool or through your application folks. Hopefully that's an answer. Anything else? Nothing yet. Oh, here we go. Can you see the amount of th uh, threading, thrashing that may be occurring in the in-memory area? Um, well, certainly you can see um, you can see the in-memory because it's it shows up in the active session history. So you can just like in what I don't know, which I haven't noticed yet. I just realized this was I don't know. You know, your OEM graphs can show you uh, you know the the current performance. I don't know if they have a different color for in-memory things. Uh, but I'm sure you can look at it through queries to see if you're doing in-memory uh, scanning, uh, which, show, would show, which should show up as thrashing inside of uh, your, S, your active session history. Is update and delete going to work in memory? Yes, updates and delete. So basically, Oracle updates both sections. It updates the row store and the column store simultaneously. So your database data is always current. So it's, uh, it's really uh, nifty. In a rack environment, do nodes know if the same tables in memory another node? So that in a rack environment, do nodes know if the same tables in memory with another node? Now, the I, I would encourage you to go and read the uh, rack sections of the uh, presentation or the uh, that the uh, prior links with the uh, notes here. There, I. I I, I do, it doesn't work the same way Cache Fusion works, where Oracle is like aware of the other rack nodes. It it works a little bit differently, and it's kind of outlined here. Um, I'm not sure if I understand it well enough to explain it. Our clients aren't currently using uh, a rack things; they're using single instance Oracle in memory and, and Active Data Guard, and those don't talk to each other at all like a rack instance does. Uh, are we going to keep how are we going to keep tables in memory? Uh, there's that urgency level, basically, or not urgency, the um, uh, priority level, and that will help keep those particular tables in memory. It's uh, They used to do Oracle in memory pinning, uh, which can work for small tables. Um, but it's just kind of like the buffer cache. It's just stored a different way. So your tables that are going to be accessed most frequently are going to stay there, and the ones that aren't drop out. Uh, I, I don't know if you can, you can change the priority to try to, you know, encourage tables to be in memory, but you can't force them to stay there, at least as far as my understanding goes. I noticed, Kumar, you have your hand raised. If you could submit your question through the Q&A, can you please do, do so? Or you can go to our website. You might have done it on accident. Try to keep the noise to a, a minimum. <laughs> um, can we send the links very via email? Uh, so this presentation gets sent out to all attendees. Is that right, Jenna? Correct. So as soon as this is ready, we'll get it posted to our website and we'll send out the links once it's ready. I'm hoping uh, today's Tuesday by end of week, um, if not sooner. Yeah, you should be able to, even though it will be a PDF, you'll be able to click through the links to go directly to them through the PDF. Yep, you'll have access to both. Right. So, and if you have any questions too, feel free to email me personally. I'm jenna.starmer, S-T-A-R, M as in Mary, E-R, at databill.com. And I can answer your questions. Yeah, and she can get questions to me also if uh, you True. have any questions. You don't want or me. Or our team, yeah, since right. most of the people on my team are smarter than me. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Zane is the smartest. All right. I think that's all for today. I don't see anything else coming in. Like I said, you know, feel free to go to databill.com. 
um, we'll get you the presentation and recording just as soon as it's available. Um, thank you, Zane. Thanks, group. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye. Bye.